start by offering a definition of leadership that might be a little different than what we usually think of, but it has to do, I think, with this gathering, and that is leadership is the ability to bring people together to move something forward. And I have been fascinated by this all of my life. I grew up in a very small fishing farming community, and I watched the community pull together and create a remarkable nonprofit. In my years as a Pan American flight attendant, I noticed that it was interesting how some flights, things just came together, the cockpit crew, the cabin crew. As a parent, I've been fascinated by what our children can manage to accomplish by gathering people together to move things forward in a variety of circumstances. As a chief financial officer of a big business school, how did the faculty manage to launch an entrepreneur center in almost no time? And so in each of these cases, and in studies that I have done since, and writing that I've done, I've been trying to discern what I think are the key practices or elements of collaborative leadership. I want to share with you three of them today, and a practice for each of them, you might think of it as like an exercise you can do when you get home, that will enable you to strengthen those capacities. And the three capacities are, and each of you may hopefully have a bookmark that has the practices we'll have. The three characteristics are curiosity, creativity, and collaboration. So let me talk a bit about the first, and that is curiosity. The thing that creates curiosity in us is the ability to ask softball questions, open kind of questions that draw out the other person. And there are qualities of those questions that seem quite simple. I want to share them with you. Uh, but they're not so easy to do. The first quality is that when you ask the question, nobody but the person you ask the question to would be able to answer it of anybody on the face of the earth. So if I say to you, what's something we would not find on your resume that has shaped who you are, when you answer that, you're the complete authority of your answer. I can't second guess you. So nobody but the person could answer that question. The second quality is that the question contains no veiled advice. So when we're asking a question, we may be tempted to say, have you considered fill in the blank? That's veiled advice. But you might say to someone instead, what have you thought about in trying to solve that problem? That's completely open. So no veiled advice. And the third is that it contains no veiled judgment. So the question, don't you think it's George's fault, which does have a question mark at the end of it, is not a question, it's veiled judgment. So instead you might say, this is a difficult situation. What do you think might be at the heart of it? So those are softball questions. They make us more curious and they invite the other into the conversation. Usually, when I'm teaching this to a group, I do it by having people practice softball questions on me. So one time I was working in the intelligence community and the dilemma I had was I hated my car. I had an ugly old car, but it was still running. I didn't think you should get rid of it just because it was ugly. So I had people practice questions on me. And one person said, well, uh, why don't you want to buy a new car? And I said, because I'll have to negotiate the price and I hate handling. And I thought, well, that's a good answer. Then another person said to me, what qualities do you want in a car? And I said, well, I'd like it to be good mileage, solid, practical, sensible, safe, good. So we're doing fine here. They're getting the hang of asking softball questions. And then somebody out there said, if you could have any car you wanted on the face of the earth, what would it be? And I said, a torch red Mustang convertible. <laughs> and I thought, who said that? <laughs> so a couple more questions, and then someone over here said, and this wasn't a perfect question, but it got me, why don't you think you deserve the car you want? So I got in my ugly old threadbare car and I started around the Washington Beltway. I was stuck in the traffic stop. 
I called a friend of mine at Ford Motor Company who had been pestering me to buy a car. And he answered the phone and he said, what do you want? And I said, a torch red Mustang. <laughs> and in the midst of a snowstorm, in February, I picked up my torch red Mustang convertible and I still own it. I love that car. <laughs> so, what I learned from that is that when people ask you really good questions like that, you say more than you really knew. And you open up a conversation that's totally different. So that's questions, all right? Ready for the next tool? This is low tech, huh? Right. The next tool strengthens our capacity for creativity. And what is wonderful about this tool is you can use it individually, you can use it in teams, you can use it in your family. And the rule of six says this, when you're trying to solve a problem, you say to yourself, so what's one option? You may say, whether or not I should do something, that's not two options. Whether or not is one option, All right? But you are required to come up with six possible steps you might take. After the first one or two, you're out of your usual suspects and you're into more interesting territory. When you get all six, your mind now is tracking data on all six. The mind only pays attention to theories it's working on. And your idea of how to solve this problem is a theory. If you have six, you will collect data on a wide range of possibilities. So let me give you an example of how this worked in our family on one particular dilemma. We were operating a 450-acre dairy farm in Garrett County, Maryland at 3,000 feet. Dairy is tough, and 3,000 feet is very cold. So it was a rough place, and every year it looked like the dairy farm would take off, and every year it went into financial difficulties, and everything was mortgaged. The cows, the land, the barns, the houses, the whole thing. So we were carrying a lot of debt. And having had enough of this at one point, we decided to rule a six the farm. And friends of mine now talk about this process as rule of sixing something. So the first option was bankruptcy. I was sure that was where we would end up, and that was the only one that didn't come true. The second option was get rid of our cows and get somebody else's cows in there. And the third was no cows at all, run it as a crop farm. You've got to be kidding. You can't really carry that level of debt with grass and hay. But we, you're required, if it's an idea, to put it up to the six. The fourth was run it as a retreat center, do these kinds of programs in a barn. We're looking here. here. Uh, the fifth is run it as a model farm, like a university extension farm, wouldn't that be great? And the sixth was because my stepson Ethan loves animals, run it as an animal rescue center. I was running the numbers on that and they were negative. So the question was what should we do? And this is what happened. We sold off our cows and took the money and paid off cow debt and put an ad in the local paper that was lo we're looking for people with cows and within two weeks a family with 75 cows who had been kicked off the farm they were leasing showed up and settled into the farm and it was wonderful. Six months later, six months later, the cows are all out in the field, everything is fine, the sun is shining and a rat gnaws through the wire in the barn and burns it to the ground. But we had thought about no cows at all, so we didn't do the knee-jerk thing of rebuilding. We took the insurance settlement, we paid off the debt on the farm. Then you could run it as a crop farm. I tried the retreat center option, did a wonderful program with the person who taught me the rule of six on what Native Americans, it was the Oneida tradition that she was from, could teach corporate people about change. It was wonderfully successful. That is a rough way to go to teach people in a barn and feed people down below. So I said, won't do that again. The model farm idea, the university never picked up on it. But a young Mennonite couple came to us and rented part of the farm and created a whole range of wonderful products that they offered at local grocery stores. It was a model farm, just not a university one. The animal rescue, my stepson Ethan found a couple, three pigs and brought them in to live at the farm. But he began to realize he couldn't rescue all the animals. And if he couldn't rescue them, maybe he could keep people from eating them. So he founded a company that creates 
protein from plants. It's called Beyond Beef. And he is CEO of that firm now in California, which he is wildly successful. So every single thing except bankruptcy happened over time because we had all of them in our mind. All of them in our mind. So let's take the third practice, which is called Cone in the Box. And here you have a visual. You don't know that this is a cone, a three-dimensional cone in this closed box. But you have a peephole you're looking in, trying to figure this out. And it's important. You want to know what's in the box. So um, I'm going to actually introduce this the way the wild man researcher pilot introduced it to me. It was like this. He divided the room in half, and he said, all right, all of you over here are looking in from peephole A straight in, and you're trying to figure out what this thing is. And you can't tell, and usually the engineers will say to me how much light is there, and I'll say, enough so you can see. So they're looking in from the top, and I say, so what do you see? And people looking at this say, well, circle. So then I turn to this group of people on the other side, and I say, now you're looking in from the side. You don't know what's in there either. It's really important. What will you tell me you see? And people will eventually say, triangle. All right, so now we have circle over here, triangle over here. How do you resolve this? If you vote on it, the side with the most people wins, but you don't know what you have. If you let the loudest voice or the most important person carry the day, what you have is some respect for that person, but you don't know what you have in the box. In order to figure out what is in the box, you have two critical capacities you have to exercise. One is, you have to say very clearly what you see. No backing down because they're noisier. Right? At the same time, what you see is partial. It's not all of the story, so you have to remain very curious and draw out the thinking of the other. And when you do that over time, it begins to dawn on you collectively that what you have here has more dimensions than any one of you can see. The key to this in situations in family, in teams, in organizations is stay away from its spot. This group was brilliant. They said circle. They didn't say it's a circle. This group said triangle. They didn't say it's a triangle. As soon as you shift the it's up, you're in a debate. And a debate is a winner and a loser. And when anyone wins, we all lose. So Cone in the Box, thank you, Bob Jeanette, for having created this visual up on a board so that produced for me as a Midwestern, shy, do not rock the boat human being, a backbone of steel in midlife, which you would have thought was too late to get that. And at the same time, it has reminded me how important it is that I am genuinely curious about the perspective of someone who does not see things the way I see them. Now, as you listen to these three practices, you may be saying to yourself, as groups often say to me, oh, this is going to take time. We don't have time. We are busy people here. So what I would suggest is that these practices do take time. They take slowing down. They take stepping back. They take listening in an entirely different way to someone that you're not sure you should pay attention to. Right? They take all those kinds of qualities because they give us spaciousness and time to see what might be possible that we've otherwise overlooked. So to wrap up, what I want to do is to offer a poem. Uh, I forgot to mention that one of the great pulling togethers that I've been part of was organizing a large poetry event that looked like it was going to go off the rails that didn't because of the team that was involved in it. And as one of the poets, I thought I'd close with a poem. It's about spaciousness. For those of you who've ever done camping or build a fire in the fireplace or haven't yet changed it over to gas, I think you'll enjoy this poem. And for those of you who picked up, picked up a bookmark, it's on the back of your bookmark. 
It's called fire. What makes a fire burn is space between the logs, a breathing space. Too much of a good thing, too many logs packed in too tight, can douse the flames almost as surely as a pail of water would. So building fires requires attention. You might think fires of creativity and collaboration. So building fires requires attention to the spaces in between as much as to the wood. When we are able to build open spaces in the same way we have learned to pile on the logs, then we can come to see how it is fuel and absence of the fuel together that make fire possible. We only need to lay a log lightly from time to time. A fire grows simply because the space is there with openings in which the flame that knows just how it wants to burn can find its way. So here's wishing you curiosity, creativity, collaboration, and a great day. Thank you.